you should support the right to repair the movement. So to start off, I'd like to talk about a trip I took to Colorado uh, just a couple of years ago. It's actually the only vacation I've really ever taken. Uh, up until that point, uh, the furthest I've been outside of Iowa was Omaha. So it's a pretty big deal for me. I was really nervous and about an hour out from Denver, about eight hours into my trip, um, I decided to pull over for the night, get a hotel room, and then my wheel locked up and wouldn't move anymore. So this made me even more nervous. Uh, we got a hotel room, I took a look at it, I woke up in the morning, walked to three different auto repair stores, bought a handful of different parts and tools, walked back, and I decided I would try to fix it myself because I'm a handy guy. And luckily I was able to. Uh, it was actually a bolt about this size completely stopped my entire vehicle. So um, I was able to get on the road again and the vacation was saved. Um, now, question I have for you guys is, what if I was riding a John Deere tractor instead? So, I know it's kind of weird. Uh, obviously, it'd be a lot slower, but um, there's actually a lot of other things with that too. Uh, yeah, I would not be able to fix it, mainly because John Deere does not want you to fix your own equipment. Um, if you have a new John Deere tractor, uh, you cannot get parts from anywhere. You have to call up a specialized technician. They're the only ones that have access to the parts and they have to come out and most of the stuff in your tractor is actually locked down by software. So even if you could repair it, unless you have somebody that has access to that, that can tell it to go ahead and run, they would not be able to. So this brings up a great question. So who owns the property, you or people that made it? So John Deere would like to have you believe that software is kind of like a book. You know, you can buy a book, but you don't have the right to copy that book, to modify that book. Uh, distributing all other copies, you know, but somebody else like Mark Wilson, a Supreme Court uh, attorney, would tell you that, hey, when you buy a book, you know, you own the physical book and you can do whatever you want with it. So that could be like setting it on fire, you can make notes in the margins, uh, you can make it do a lab shape if you want to. So the right to repair movement typically comes down to like five things that they want companies to do. So they want uh, companies to be more forward with information and documentation such as schematics, uh, parts and equipment such as specialized security screws or let's say for your phone like an OEM screen instead of like a cheap Chinese knockoff one. Um, diagnostic tools, um, we want it so that the hardware we have, the phones we have, um, we don't have to be locked to the same software behind it like the operating system. We want to be able to unlock that phone and put something else on it. We have the hardware, we bought it, we'd like to do something else with it. Uh, also designed for the future. So when you have a phone, you don't want it to die out after a couple of years to make it break. Um, we want to have it so that we can repair these things, we can upkeep with them, we can make them more useful for longer. Now, uh, there are three key things that I want to talk about today as far as the uh, right to repair movement, um, how it can affect your wallet, the environment, and the economy. So first, talk about the wallet. So uh, anybody in here ever, ever played Pokemon? Heard Pokemon? A couple people? So, um, we're going to talk about this specific game here. It's called Pokemon Emerald. Um, with most of the original Pokemon games, they had a coin battery inside of it. So that's that blue thing there on the right. Um, that battery is involved with a lot of things in the game. It might be just the save data. It could be if you have timed events in the game. But it's like any coin battery. When it drains, it's out. And it affects your game. Sometimes you can't save your game at all. It becomes unplayable. <clears throat> so I actually, as a hobby, have taught myself how to replace batteries in the Pokemon games. It's a soldering technique that you have to get in there to do. Um, so if you buy those batteries in bulk, it's like 50 cents. Um, this game, I sell my work for $230. And I tell you, when I put it out, it sells that weekend. So we do a service at my work that I actually do where we you can bring in your own game and we can replace the battery for you. It costs about 15 bucks. So I'd ask you, what would you rather do? Spend $230 on a used copy that may have a dead battery in it or spend 15 bucks to have yours repaired and last a long time. Now, um, instead of throwing it out, you think, obviously, it's repair it, you know, but sometimes you can't repair it. And that's a lot of things to do with the company that made the items, too. So, another example, video game example again Microsoft, Xbox 360s. They had a lot of issues, and I actually had an issue with one before. I had two Xbox 360s, um, one had a faulty DVD dr uh, drive, the other one had a faulty power supply. So I thought, hey, why don't I take the DVD drive from one, put it in the other? Um, get, maybe it work right? Wrong. So 
they actually had set it up so that each hard, uh, each uh, DVD drive is set to that specific hardware, the motherboard. So if you, it doesn't recognize the one that it came with, it won't play anything. So that ends up being e-waste. What I do with those two Xbox 360s, instead of having one working one, I had to throw them both away. So Americans create 6.9 million tons of e-waste every year, just electronics going to the landfill. Another way to look at this is, when you think about it, everybody buys a cell phone probably once every couple years, maybe. Uh, some people like that, that last as long as possible, but I mean, every year, Americans buy about 160 million new smartphones. Another way you can think of this in materials, it's like creating a new Empire State Building of materials every six days. Now, the right to repair, it's good for the economy, or not, I mean, for the environment, um, because if you repair your equipped stuff, obviously you don't have to throw it away as much. Now, it's also good for the economy, I'd argue yes. Um, so anybody here ever tried to get a McFlurry from McDonald's and told his machine was down? Yeah. So uh, a lot like the John Deere um, uh, tractor issue, uh, their machines are actually locked behind a lot of proprietary uh, software. So unless you are a uh, person um, that was trained by a certain company, you can't get access to that at all. So even if you're the franchisee that owns a machine, you can't do anything with it. So because of that, at any given time, thanks to uh, McBroken.com, about 10% or more uh, McFlurry machines are down at any given time. So what if um, McDonald's had opened up that technology to more people? You could have companies stop and pop up that are designed just to fix McFlurry machines. They create more jobs. We'd have more ice cream, I would argue, <laughs> more often. Um, another thing to look at would be like, let's say an iPhone repair. So in Ankeny, um, there's a few places that you can take your phone to to get it fixed if you break your screen. So just as an example, looking at an iPhone 14. So if you're going to take it to Ankeny Fix It, uh, they charge $179 to replace the screen. It takes less than an hour usually. But you can see from there, the average cost to replace the screen is probably about 250 bucks, I'd say. If you're to go to Batteries Plus, a place I drive by every time I come to DMAC, uh, they charge $240 to replace that screen. Now, how much does that cost for the screen? If you go to eBay to buy it, about 25 bucks. And that comes with tools. So, um, I would argue that if uh, like Apple would put out more schematics and more product that they could uh, let users uh, fix their own phones, you could end up having more places open up that do repair jobs. They're not limited to just a couple of them. And then you might get a place that maybe instead of charging a hundred or instead of charging a thousand percent markup on it, maybe they'll charge three hundred percent markup on it. Now we've talked about how this can affect the economy, the environment, and your wallet. Um, and I would say that kind of the last thing I'd like to leave you with would be um, just think about that moment when you drop your phone next, and you have that moment where like time freezes, slows down to a halt and you just have a moment where you don't know if your phone's broken or not. Should it really make you feel like it's the end of the world if your phone's broken? I argue no. It should be easier. Get your phone fixed. Thank you.